Dr. Neil Robertson is associate, sorry, is professor in the foundation year early modern studies and contemporary studies programs at the University of King's College. Dr. Robertson graduated from King's College in 1985 with a BA in political science. He went on to take an MA in classics at Dalhousie University and in 1995 completed his PhD at Cambridge in social and political science. He has held the position of director of the foundation year program and is past director of the Early Modern Studies Program, which he helped to found. Dr. Robertson was the King's College Dean of Residence, 1989-1990, and has served as chair of faculty. His research interests include contemporary political thought, early modern political thought, and the shaping of modernity in early modern Europe. And he's asked me to add mention of the fact that he recently published a book on Leo Strauss, and that was this past fall. If I've made any errors in what I've said, Dr. Robertson himself can correct them. Neil Robertson. Yeah, so this is just an infomercial for my book, <laughs> uh, which is available at all good bookstores. <laughs> um, Father Thorne tells us on the first page of his paper, my paper today will be less academic and more focused on the practical daily living during a pandemic of a Christian in the Anglican prayer book tradition. I'm afraid in these terms, the paper is a bit of a failure. <laughs> Unless, of course, one means by practical daily living, the most wonderfully elucidating and liberating understanding of the meaning of suffering and affliction in the lives of Christians, and more specifically for us who have been living in the midst of a pandemic. There are other places in Father Thorne's paper, and here I'm basically basing this on a probably earlier draft, so some of these may be inaccurate uh, moments of teasing. Um, there are other places in Do Father Thorne's paper where it is hard to reconcile his stated intentions and his actual practice. He tells us that he will not focus on the deficiencies of the current 1962 Book of Common Prayer, which has removed references to a robust biblical understanding of illness within God's loving providence, found in the 1662 BCP and earlier forms of the ministry to the visitation of the sick. He does not want to appeal to what he calls the glory of an earlier age. And yet, just a few pages later, he cannot restrain himself from saying, it is unfortunate that this splendid exhortation, the one in the 1662 prayer book, has not been preserved in our 1962 Canadian Book of Common Prayer. Indeed, the whole argument of the paper is to recover the standpoint by which to understand rightly that older account in which human suffering could be placed within an understanding of a loving divine providence. Indeed, what the paper highlights is not only the theological glories of a past age, but of our current incapacity to recover or live in those glories. Indeed, that for us, the good and healthy waters of this older theological standpoint are rather deadly poison. To speak in the language of the 1662 Book of Common Prayer is for us a scandal and deep offense, harmful both for believer and unbeliever, a source of crisis for faith. But why is this? Why has this doctrine become not only unpalatable, but incomprehensible, and insofar as we do comprehend it, offensive to us? Part of the answer is that we have forgotten what the language of the visitation of the sick means and that Father Thorne has so helpfully recovered for us, that to speak of sickness as God's visitation is not to describe a specific causality in which a specific sickness is sent as a response to a specific sin, either as a judgment or a correction of that sin. In the 1980s, such language was used by certain preachers to speak about the AIDS virus as a judgment on sexual and specifically gay immorality. The prayer book does not invite us to become Job's comforters. As Father Thorne tells us, by the 20th century, the exhortation of the office of the visitation of the sick was, was interpreted to suggest that the suffering of the sick person 
was direct punishment, visitation, for personal sin. Of course, any such interpretation that views suffering as divinely imposed consequence of personal moral failing is reprehensible and amounts to nothing less than blaming the victim for their own illness. Yesterday morning, Dr. Curran and Father Nicole both pointed out that such a standpoint, this blaming the victim standpoint, was directly contrary to Jesus' words in Luke 13 about the Tower of Siloam, or however else you pronounce it, (laughs) where just such an account of suffering is explicitly repudiated. And so it's not as if the framers of the 1662 prayer book had forgotten that passage. The way to avoid this completely distorting interpretation, the one that reads uh, the exhortation as a judgment on specific sin and specific punishment or specific uh, intervention in relationship to that, the way to avoid this completely distorting interpretation, Father Thorne helpfully points out, is to recall Augustine who set the question in the much larger frame of human fallenness and original sin. If we want to have a sense of a crucial aspect of our contemporary incapacity to grasp the meaning of the visitation to the sick, it lies in our break with the sense of the world and the human condition as fallen in the cosmic and ontological sense that Father Thorne is recovering by turning to Augustine. What Augustine brings to light is that suffering is not some terrible accident that happens in a world that is otherwise orderly and supportive of our natural humanity. That paradisal relation, while still implicit in the world and in our desires, has been radically and systematically disrupted in our very exposure and vulnerability to harmful contingency and externality, what we would call our fallen finitude. This is our punishment in being cast out of Eden and is displayed in Adam and Eve's need to labor both in our human productions and reproductions. It is, of course, into this state that Christ entered and suffered and died and so took upon himself the standpoint of sin. Indeed, that Christ suffered specific sufferings while sinless and indeed redeeming us through those sufferings is the most complete repudiation of the moral causality linking specific sufferings to specific sins. But this takes us to the hardest question that Father Thorne is raising. If we accept that my or your suffering a sickness or really any other state of affliction is not to be causally tied to a specific sin, but rather is to be seen as an occasion and manifestation of our fallenness, and so an opportunity for repentance and spiritual growth, for sanctification, what are we to make of the specificity of that suffering? At one level, our tendency is to say that there just is no explanation. Why did this child get cancer? Why did this city suffer devastation? These are just instances of our fallen world and the contingency and destructiveness implicit in it. A scientist can explain it non-teleologically as a natural phenomenon, an event happening within the order of nature. But it is relative to God and his purposes and providence meaningless. Indeed, for those suffering the experience is often precisely meaningless in that they may in any number of ways be incapable of a spiritual reflection upon their own suffering. They're too young or without faith or mentally unwell or afflicted beyond all rational recovery. Such evils seem to fall outside of any theodicy that would claim to grasp here how the evil God's omnipotence allows by what Luther called how the evil God's omnipotence allows by what Luther called an alien 
as opposed to a proper act of God, can be the means for a greater good. For Leibniz, building on and seeking to make manifest the relation of good and evil, of the proper acts and the alien acts of God, the evil in this world belongs to it under God's omnipotent providence, predestination, and predetermination as subservient to a greater good. One of the ways in which the visitation of the sick has become incomprehensible is precisely in our contemporary refusal of this logic, a logic that arises from the transformation of causality in modern philosophy and the science of nature. The standpoint of what can be called a cosmic utilitarianism. What I think Father Thorne is suggesting is that the visitation of the sick is not and cannot be subjected to this logic. I want to suggest that what we need to do is to clarify the issue, to clarify the issue is to look a little more closely at what the language of divine visitation is assuming and what it is not assuming. For the contemporary believer, the whole difficulty is finding God in these events by which we are afflicted. It seems altogether more pious pastorally and pastorally wise to not connect what are surely contingent and accidental features of existence, disease, pain, and all forms of suffering to divine will and intention to God's purposes. Surely he can only intend, however ineffectually, our health, prosperity, and flourishing, and never our affliction. To draw God into the afflicting itself is to somehow implicate him in a worldly causality of these afflictions, and so to make God, however indirectly, a or the source of not just human suffering, but of this specific suffering. Insofar as we need to explain evil as arising from the causality of the world as divinely created or governed, we seem to need to make this ascription, God caused my or my child suffering, a seemingly meaningless suffering, and any effort I make to explain this easily becomes superficial and in the face of deep suffering, a real evil itself. I want to call such an account a substantial teleology of evil. There is a substantial purpose in the world's causality that explains, in quotation marks, by some larger purpose achieved, this evil. The evil belongs to a cosmic or substantial teleology. It seems that this is just the kind of thinking that Father Thorne is warning us to avoid. But surely such a substantial teleology of evil is at work in the exhortation's claim. Wherefore, whatsoever your sickness is, know you certainly that it is God's visitation. How can this sickness, this specific sickness, not be caused by God, and yet also be his visitation, and so belong to his willing and working all things in this world by his omnipotent will? While our thoughts may go to this concern, I want to suggest that the visitation of the sick is in a way agnostic about that question. And this perhaps explains Father Thorne's wisdom in not raising it, and my folly in doing so. <laughs> there is a teleology at work in the visitation of the sick, in that it makes of the contingency of specific suffering a divine work. But I want to suggest that we need to see this teleology as a teleology of faith and not of substance. To understand that an illness, or really any suffering, is a visitation is not to ascribe its cause to God simply and directly as his positive will, though even such contingencies that are productive of both good and evil need to be placed within not only his providence but more fully within his omnipotence. That is at a different level. The way that Luther captures the point I'm trying to make is by distinguishing, as I've already noted, what he calls alien acts of God from proper acts of God. Properly, God wills only our well-being, our salvation and happiness. But in and by the force of allowing our fallenness, there are alien acts of God, acts that God wills or does as other than his proper acts, that bring about suffering and indeed evil, but these is contained within his providence, within his proper acts. 
The most radical way these two sides belong together can be seen in the crucifixion, in God's most complete self-alienation. So we need to understand the language of visitation of a sickness spoken of in the 1662 as just such an alien act of God, that sickness or more generally any suffering qua suffering cannot be the proper act of a God who wills only what is good. But insofar as we are fallen and live in a fallen world, that suffering, that harm, and indeed evil becomes a visitation of God we can and will encounter in that suffering, God in that suffering, in that visitation. To make a little more sense of this point, I want to draw upon the recent paper that Father Thorne mentioned by Matthew uh, Oliver. Father Oliver points out that it is helpful to recall the wider use of the language of visitation in both Scripture and the Book of Common Prayer to grasp the language in the visitation of the sick. In a way, the whole Christian religion can be spoken of as a religion of visitation. Really, what else is the incarnation but the the visitation of God in human flesh? So throughout the scripture, visitation appears as an injunction upon Christians to visit the poor and those in prison. One can really do a kind of analysis of the gospel as a gospel of visitation, In the exhortation, the priest is addressing the believing parishioner to see their suffering as a divine visitation. I want to suggest that what this requires and presupposes is faith. It is the faith of parishioners which enables them to see this suffering, this illness, as a visitation. In a way, our model here is Jesus on the cross, who at the point of his most complete affliction in the moment of divine dereliction, still can cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There is a visitation even in this forsakenness. In the withdrawal of visitation, there is a visitation. However, more specifically, I want us to think of the way in which the Eucharist is a visitation. We discern Christ's presence by faith, As the 39 articles tell us, the body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after a heavenly and spiritual manner. And the means whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. So we need to see the visitation of sickness and suffering as deriving its meaning, not from the standpoint of a natural causal determination, but precisely in and through faith, which is no simply subjective state, but is itself a divine visitation. I find hugely helpful here a set of distinctions that Luther makes at the conclusion of his greatest work, The Bondage of the Will. There he tells us that we need to distinguish three lights, the light of nature, the light of grace, and the light of glory. For the light of nature, there is a fundamental problem that cannot be resolved at the light, at the level of the light of nature. Why do the good suffer and the evil prosper? We've already heard the psalm that uh, cites this point. By good, we mean those judged good by the light of nature, the virtuous and humane in worldly terms. The evil are those who are evil by those natural terms. So also suffering and prosperity are here understood at this natural level. And I think a great deal of our confusion about how to understand suffering is that we remain at this natural level, as indeed do many who suffer. And it is our desire and need to hold to the integrity of their understanding that is so problematic here. But Luther suggests the problem of the suffering of good and the prospering of the evil is resolved by the light of grace. This resolution takes two forms. One is that there is for grace a larger context, the context that Father Thorne has been bringing out, that the standpoint of a life beyond this life can be the remedy for the false outcomes achieved in life here. There is a wider context. But beyond this, Luther also brings out that the prospering of the evil 
And the suffering of the good is only, in a way, apparent. But to see this, we need to see that both good and evil and suffering on prosperity need to be seen as transformed. This is, of course, not to say that the natural, sensible suffering or prosperity is as natural and sensible changed in any way. But it now has another dimension, another standpoint, the standpoint that Father Thorne discerned in Felicitas. How then does meaningless contingent suffering become divinely given affliction? For Luther, this is what the light of grace provides. Our justification in Christ means that we are at the deepest level indifferent to both joy and sorrow, prosperity and suffering in our natural lives. For nothing we do or suffer can affect our salvation. In Christ, we have overcome the world. This is the sense in which Luther fully agrees with Simon Weil, for it is from the standpoint of grace, of justification, that we can use suffering, or more accurately, grace can use suffering. It and its opposite, suffering and its opposite, are both means for our sanctification, for our growth and formation in Christ. Sickness and well-being are both forms of divine visitation for the believer. Just as they are both works of the devil for unbelief, so it is faith that makes possible this transformation by which suffering becomes divine visitation. And just as with the real presence in the Eucharist that is made present by faith, so is the divine visitation no mere subjective reading, but the discerning of the real presence of God in the midst and by means of suffering. Luther is aware that there remain in the relation of good and evil and the relation of belief to unbelief deep problems that arise only at the level of grace. These problems of the relation of human agency to divine omnipotence or of contingency to divine governance await, according to Luther, the standpoint of the light of glory. But he tells us, but the light of glory insists otherwise and will one day reveal God to whom alone belongs a judgment whose justice is incomprehensible as a God whose justice is most righteous and evident, provide only that in the meanwhile we believe it, as we are instructed and encouraged to do by the example of the light of grace explaining what was a puzzle of the same order to the light of nature. But has any of this really answered or explained or even addressed the terrible incomprehensibility of death and suffering in a world under, under God's providence? No. Rather, it is underlining this very irreconcilability, that we can't be reconciled to this. It is a strange business that as we seemingly come to more and more heal the breach of the fall through technological capitalist modernity's capacity to master the realm of external contingency and make the lifelong fulfillment of human need and desire something more and more universally available that this has led to a society more and more indifferent to a knowing and living within divine providence. As the moments of death and suffering have become more marginal, less omnipresent, we lose sight of God's providence. For this society, the breaches of human well-being are not experienced as visitations of that providence to recall us to our fallen condition and the need to repent and recognize our continual dependence upon a God who loves us even in our indifference or abandonment of him. But the moments of affliction are today rather moments best seen as outside or beyond all intention and purpose, or in fact evidence that there is no God at all. I'm reminded of something that I was told by scholars uh, whom I met as a graduate student working in the rare books room at Cambridge University Library. These scholars of Darwin told me that Darwin lost his Christian faith, not with his insight into the theory of evolution, but because of the loss of his young daughter to an illness, a thing he found incomprehensible with the idea of a loving providential God. And indeed, it is incomprehensible as a proper act of God. God wants not only the life, but the fullest life for that or any other daughter or son. 
the visitation of the sick is not meant to explain or reconcile us to such events as events within divine providence. Only the light of glory can bring that healing and insight. What the visitation of the sick is for is for those with faith to see in the suffering not an abandonment by God to that externality and contingency or the loss of their life in divine providence, but as Father Soren has shown us, the deepest sense that for us that very suffering can become the afflicted space in our life with and in God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Robertson. Now, our time of questions and discussion. Does anyone wish to say something, or more particularly, to address a question to one of the two speakers this morning? Who wants to go first? Father Hebb. Yes, uh, the, I'm thinking particularly Gary, because he brought up the whole subject of practicality. Um, As it is true that the visitation service is no longer comprehensible to the 20th century, let alone the 21st, it seems to me there are other things that have taken place too. Our society has continued its journey and evolution away from common shared suppositions that make the uh, preaching of the gospel and uh, the meeting of minds more and more challenging. It seems to me that the focus certainly in recent decades, uh, so that your typical parishioner has been uh, an upset with God, not so much about their own personal suffering, but about the suffering of others, particularly its other family members. That seems to upset people more uh, than the, their immediate suffering. And, and they question that suffering of their loved ones. So that's, that's a, another emphasis that, that is shown. And then, of course, the other thing, of course, is that we've reached the point, as we all know full well, uh, that this suffering, particularly if it's physical pain or other sorts of suffering, uh, is now an out. Uh, and that's government approved, government sanctioned, uh, medically assisted suicide. That, that's my terminology, and I'll stand by it. Uh, and uh, so my question to Father Thorne is, uh, where do we meet? Uh, the reality. Uh, how, how do we meet, how do we address those people uh, who live in the world where uh, those two things are very much uh, forward in their minds? Uh, they're, they're upset or concerned about God, and I really hate this word, allowing their loved ones to suffer. And uh, the temptation uh, of uh, a, uh, an escape and I think it's a temptation that uh, even you know, uh, faithful church-going people, with the more it's done, the more it becomes uh, tempting. Clearly, I don't have an answer for you, but uh, the, um, the, the, the question um, includes uh, so much of, of, of why there is no ultimate uh, answer. Uh, the, not only uh, through, is it that the secular world and uh, the, those who live in, in Christendom, that those who are baptized have different um, anthropologies and um, but even within the church um, I think there's a, a great lack of any appreciation of final cause of, of the beatific vision of what it means to be human is defined in terms of uh, why we were created, that is, that the, um, that the 
function, in a way, precedes the essence, uh, and, and uh, which is about sanctification. But if a Christian does not understand what it is to be human in terms of their final end, um, then they share the secular uh, notion of what it is to be human. And the spiritual sort of disappears, or the spiritual begin, uh, or that the, the spiritual becomes nothing other than what the spiritual is for the secular humanist. Um, I don't, uh, other people, uh, Neil certainly can comment uh, on this better than I and maybe other people. Well, I mean, <coughs> one way to think about what's going on is that uh, we have lived in a culture which had its roots in a Christian understanding. And there were many that then established a secular world which nonetheless still had behind it certain sets of Christian assumptions, uh, such as an afterlife and a sense of eternity and a kind of uh, um, sense of creativeness and givenness and so on and so forth. And we're engaged in, you might say, a process in which the distinction between the light of nature and the light of grace is becoming clearer. And so uh, I think at the level of the light of nature, if I can put it that way, for a natural subjectivity, a natural human being existing at that level, the kinds of arguments that one uh, engages with about whether medically assisted dying is a uh, good or an evil act become questions that are relative to that light. Uh, and uh, I think that there are arguments on both sides of that level. Uh, and so I, I think we're looking, you might say, at this cultural moment in which those two lights are more fully distinguishing themselves, whether one should, from the standpoint of the light of grace, insist that the light of nature argue other than its own true teaching, I'm not sure that that's a position that uh, is sustainable. So this may be a separating out in our culture. Whether that light of nature is sustainable in its own terms ultimately is an entirely different matter. And, and uh, I, I, I think that uh, during the pandemic, uh, the, um, the role of the church, what uh, um, the protocols that our, our bishops and, and national churches, um, what they were recommending and imposing, and what many in the church, many, many priests and, and faithful, how, how they responded. I think that how um, that they were not able to have a conversation that they were talking past one another is because of the reason that Neil is pointing out uh, as well. And um, I think that, uh, that this sort of clarity uh, may have helped um, to begin a conversation or to establish the basis um, that a conversation could be had. You know, the, the bishops simply told us that uh, um, physical well-being and uh, safety, you know, be safe, you know, um, that was all from a natural sort of uh, standpoint that, that was, uh, in a way, uh, embracing the, um, that secular uh, light of nature and so many others and many in this room uh, I, I think I know, at least I suspect, um, we're seeing the deficiency uh, in that because um, they, what they, their whole lives of ministry 
uh, their Christian lives, um, they seek uh, the light of, of grace and, and to live in that light of grace. And, uh, you know, there, there is just uh, people talking past one another, as, as you, you speak about for us. Father Head. Um, in a sense, uh, my comment for both speakers, um, I'll just make one comment and then, then I have a question. I think these are related. Um, you know, when the, when the pandemic was struck, I think a lot of us looked to our prayer book, right, for guidance and for prayer. And one of the things I think a number of us discovered is that in the, in the 1918 prayer book, Maybe book, the, um, there was a prayer for plague, mm -hmm. which by the 1960s was utterly removed. Mm -hmm. It's not there in the occasional prayers. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I mean, it struck me at the time that there is, is there a kind of, uh, is there a kind of hubris or just a confidence that by, you know, through modern scientific means, we pass beyond the age where we need to, to, uh, but we're not going to be afflicted by these kinds of things. Um, the prayer itself says, you know, the end of the prayer is bless this visitation to our use. Mm -hmm. that, that logic is just gone. Um, at the same time, I was, you know, we used it at St. George's, I know a number of people did in their parishes, but the language of it is, is difficult um, because it, I think it led, tends towards, or is at least interpreted in this this kind of direct causality. Um, what we try to do in the, in the parish is to use it in the daily offices to try and pray our way into that prayer, to try and recover that sense of, of, of its meaning. Um, so that's my one comment. Um, my question is uh, thinking about the, the visitation for the sick. In my experience, often, well, personally, being in hospital myself and also visiting uh, people in hospital. Well, a hospital is, a, is a, a time when you are very much alone. You have a lot of time to think and pray about your life. Uh, and that, in my experience, people, it takes, sometimes it takes a little while, but there are things that they want to confess to you which may or may not have any direct, uh, apparent direct relation to the illness. Um, but that it is, I wonder if this in some ways gets to your point, Neil, that it, the illness can become a means by, uh, in an indirect way, a means of, of opening our hearts for repentance. But I wonder if the, if the revised prayer book office is just what we need at this moment. Um, because I think you're right, Father Farn, that the, that the exhortation can be just so cruel um, and so victim-blaming if it's just used. Um, but that the, by removing it, I, I wish I knew the, the older office and the previous prayer but the rubrics, right? Remember that in the visitation office, there are basically five or six moments, right? A moment of prayer, a moment of confession, absolution laying on your hands and so on. It's kind of a choose your own adventure. <laughs> but, the, but what the rubrics do, the rubrics will say, you know, that the priest, you know, that the, the, the sick may wish to make a confession. That what the, the office does is it push, pushes an emphasis onto the clergy, the curate, to be a, a, an intentional cure of souls. That maybe in that first visit it may not be an appropriate moment for confession. Maybe at your second visit it will be. Um, that it requires a greater discipline on the part of the clergy to know their people, to recognize where their souls may be in this moment, where their faith may be at that moment. Um, in some ways, I wonder if the, the exhortation should be like the Athanasian Creed, still put in the back as an appendix. But anyway, I just, either of you have any comments about that? There is in the 1918 prayer book, I don't think Father Thorne alluded to this, the, the prayer that may be said, or is to be said when there appeareth little hope of recovery, which is a beautiful prayer, 
But again, it would be difficult to use with so many people in 2022. Though as a parish priest, I have used it on occasion with those who are dying. In cases where it seemed pastorally appropriate, if I thought that the dying person and his or her family were at a stage uh, or level of their faith where the words of that prayer would, that they would understand it. But to say it in the presence of some people today would simply be cruel. It's a beautiful not, prayer, though. And this is not from the model of Christ when you think of the healing miracles, right? Mm. They're so different. Yes. Every single yes. one is different, right? Go, thy sins are forgiven. Uh, another, you know, uh, go and show yourselves to the priest, right? Mm. Another, they're mm -hmm. simply forgiven. There's no mention of repentance of sin. I just, yeah, that, exactly. In that sense, I wonder if the office actually does do just what we need in this moment. Mm. That's the, that's that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, is it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, it's a be it's it's a, a, a beautiful prayer, but uh, yeah. More comments. More questions. Okay. Final last. Okay, Matthew. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Okay. So, if suffering as a visitation of God does not imply, or should not imply, a kind of providential instrumentality, uh, as that would be understood in the cosmic systems of modernity, but rather as a means of our redemption, visible through the light of faith and accomplishing glory. So if that's what we've worked out, then how, how can we understand these episodes in the Old Testament, where pestilence, what we would call natural disaster, plague, are straightforwardly and simply instruments of God's purposes. And, and then I then I would make a link from there to what we saw yesterday in that wonderful church in Venice, where there's a similar kind of straightforward instrument. Now, why did the play end? It's because Mary stopped it. It was a very simple, straightforward instrumentality there. And so I'm wondering, can we call that like a mythic instrumentality or something like that? But how do we go back from what we've just accomplished into that mythic pre-modern standpoint and understand what's going on there, since it still seems pretty strange? So that's a question for either. I don't think it is strange. Uh, I don't think it is strange for uh, for many in this room. Um, I think that uh, the Old Testament, uh, when the Old Testament speaks uh, in that way, I think that's exactly how we ought to um, receive it, and we can. Um, uh, I think uh, Augustine would say that uh, we can um, receive our specific uh, illness or um, from the standpoint of, of faith, uh, natural, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of grace, we can see the specific illness that comes to us as a visitation of God. Not from the natural standpoint, but, uh, but from a spiritual standpoint, the standpoint of of grace, and I think we can uh, attribute to to the Blessed Virgin, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, pr uh, protection uh, and the salvation of Constantinople, uh, you know, at, at, at a particular at, at a particular time. I don't think that these things. Um, I think many people, maybe won't say in this room, can, can understand that and, and would be able to pray in that way. Um, but uh, from the standpoint of, 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 of faith, I mean, uh, there's a certain sense in which um, uh, all of this, uh, in, in terms of quantum uh, causality and, and the notion that um, uh, there's, uh, there's no such thing as causality, linear causality, in, in the way that uh, uh, we, we used to think of it in pre-modern times. Uh, but that, uh, you know, that 
the way scientists speak today, uh, that, uh, that everything uh, is chance, right? Uh, it's, uh, I, I mean, the, the, this is uh, the, uh, um, this is the order of things. Um, that doesn't uh, in any way uh, diminish or challenge the notion of, of providence uh, because you have a, a, a God that, that, that brings order out of that chance, right? That, 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 that love that, you know, that gives direction to it. So, um, um, so I think it's a, it's a notion of natural causality, pre-modern causality that, uh, you know, that, we're, that we are stuck on. And uh, if we hope to um, resolve things uh, at that level, uh, then uh, I, I think it's hopeless. Well, and I also think there's a crucial difference, right? Which is to say that um, there's nothing in Luther that is denying, in fact, that he actually states that God worketh all in all. Uh, but in a way, we can't discern that except through the light of glory. Uh, and he says we need to leave God to himself. But that doesn't mean that scriptures, the revelation that is found in scripture, doesn't give us access to that standpoint in particular instances. I mean, the same issue with miracles, right? Uh, and uh, so you're right, there is a logic that is happening there in which you have a divine intervention into historical life or into natural uh, causality, uh, to pick your pick, uh, both, uh, that is being specifically revealed in Scripture, that this was an act of God, right? Uh, as opposed to what the insurance sales, you know, the insurance <laughs> people say, it's when you can't figure it out, it's called an act of God. Um, you know, that's an act of God, and it's revealed in Scripture as such. But that doesn't mean that you have access to that. You can't universalize that standpoint precisely because it's a standpoint of revelation. I think that the, the uh, you know, Paul tells us that the, these scriptures, the Old Covenant, is, is given to us for our learning. And what we learn from them is both the general principle, from the, uh, especially from Genesis and, and from the book of Job, that you know, we can't establish this cause and effect relationship. Uh, but that God has chosen specific people, notwithstanding this sort of general principle, um, there's also, uh, and, and notwithstanding the fact that Sometimes he agrees not just with his chosen people in his mercy, that he's chosen them out of all the nations of the earth, but sometimes, uh, particularly with Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar, who he makes his servant uh, for his greater glory, that he does, exactly as Neil says, I mean, he does intervene in a cause and effect way. But that also becomes a general principle, because what he does with his people, with Israel, uh, you know, it epitomizes his dealing in Christ with all men. And so, um, you know, we learn from his dealing with the stiff-necked and rebellious people of how, how he chooses to deal with us, the stiff-necked and rebellious people. So if he, if he, if he does, that, that distinction is beautiful, you know, that the act of God is precisely the thing that you know uh, in terms of cause and effect. Well, this is happening because you've neglected my ordinances and my statutes. And, and, and of course, the great mercy of God uh, in, uh, in his friend Moses is to tell the Israelites not just how they should live in the land into which they're going until such time as the prophet greater than any time, but to say to them, and when you break these laws, and I do these certain things, so that not only are the scriptures written for our learning, but prophetically the law is given for their learning. So that, you know, we, we have this, uh, we have both the general principle uh, and also the particular principle. None of us can do the judging of God according to the general principle. But sometimes God, in his absolute mercy, does allow us to see the effect of our particular sin. And that's just mercy and love. Mm -hmm. yeah. Father Lasky, you're next. Yeah.
just a couple of quick comments first and then a more general thing for the speakers or anyone else to reflect on. I'm glad that I wasn't the first one at this conference to use the Q word, quantum word, that Father Thorne did that for me. But I, would, I think there is a difference between chance, and I'm going to stand a little closer because my wife and I know others are watching on Zoom and she said she couldn't hear most of the questions yesterday. So I don't have a big booming voice, so I'll try to stand a little closer. Um, I think there's a slight distinction between chance and randomness, but I, I do agree most of the secular people are talking about chance. You know. um, uh, a little challenge for Father Hebb, maybe our, our first World War historian. Uh, it seems to me from discussions yesterday and today and thinking about things that people have said to me about uh, family members dying in the Second World War as well, that 1918 really seems to have been a year where, I won't say it all fell apart, but uh, it, this, they all, and maybe chaplains have an insight into what happened, or maybe it just happened to them and they didn't notice, I don't know, but I think that there's a direct line from World War I to the 1959 prayer book. Um, uh, oh yes, and uh, Matthew's comment about the, the, uh, you know, the direct connection has been addressed, but just my, you know, the book of Job, which we're reading in the prayer book lectionary this week, doesn't give an answer, right? It's you know, basically, here's God, I'm showing up, you know, who are you? And he repents, and even though he hasn't done anything wrong, specifically, he repents in, in sackcloth and ashes. Anyway, um, I found uh, this very uh, inspiring for pastoral work. I, I really lament that loss of that prayer for one who's unable, unlikely to recover. Um, and I have used it on occasion. Uh, but, um, and yes, Father Thorne's right to take the exhortation pre-1918, again another significant date, right? 1918 prayer book was the last one that could include something like that. Um, would be seen as cruel and unusual punishment, basically. Um, but the spirit of it, I just find it so, and, and tying it to, you know, looking upon the crucified Christ in our suffering. Uh, I've read a couple of things in, in the last number of years about the, the use, quote unquote, of suffering. Um, one writer said, you know, don't waste it. Don't waste your suffering. Another one, I think it was Peter Kreeft, and I know Father Matheson will correct me, and Peter Kreeft would do this craft, actually, but most of us see the two E's, we say Kreeft, so. Um, I think it was he that was quoting someone, and I think it was in Making Sense Out of Suffering, that uh, a woman was uh, given a, a fatal diagnosis, basically, of cancer from her doctor, and her response wasn't, why me, or what did I do to deserve this? It was, she was humbled that God trusted her with it. You know, and that's a wonderful Christian um, living out of, of the idea of visitation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get personal with Father Thorne for a minute, uh, and many of you here. In, in the spring of 1998, her 11 year old son, her youngest child, was dying at the IWK. And uh, even when we told Father Thorne, we know there's other people depending on you. He was there, not quite round the clock, but pretty much, and certainly at, at the end, uh, through the whole thing, and many other uh, friends uh, among clergy and others that, uh, that showed up. Um, I wouldn't have been able to articulate all what was presented this morning at that time exactly. Uh, and, uh, but I can testify that Father Thorne ministered from the spirit of that providence. The suffering Christ was present in him and everybody else who was with us. The staff uh, and, and the clergy that visit us, the friends, the family. Uh, that visitation of the suffering Christ was, was very present with us. One thing I did when our son was in, in the ICU, I, I prayed the offices at his bedside. All kinds of different hours and I, I, uh, I asked the nurses in when I say the psalms and the prayers out loud and stuff. and, and, uh, uh, and for months after, praying the offices, doing the psalms in particular, box of Kleenex there, took half an hour or more to do just that part of the office quite often for months. And I've told several people it wasn't because I didn't believe what was there anymore, I lost, but because I knew it was true, but in a deeper sense than we usually understand these, these promises. And uh, yeah, there was something else I was probably going to say, but I probably talked myself out of it here. But. Um, but I think it is possible for us as, as, as pastors especially, and, and first of all, people visiting the sick, 
especially in you know earthly desperate situations, uh, not not uh, faith desperate situations, but to minister in that spirit that. There is, a, you know, we hear people talking, especially with, I don't like to call it made either, a, a medically caused death. Uh, you know, what's the point of their suffering? You know, well, offer it up. Right? That's, that's, that's what the point of it is. Uh, so I just wanted to testify to Father Thorne really ministered in, and many others ministered in that spirit. We can't use the words exactly, maybe looking at the eyes. I think modern, postmodern, whatever we are now, people can respond to that idea that Christ is suffering with you and in you. That's so, yeah.